Hello, and welcome to Otter Creek in Rio Grande. I thought I'd try something a little bit different this week. Uh, still waiting on a few things to work on the riverbed, and uh, I need to build some pine trees and a few other things before I continue with that. So what I thought I would do is, is show a project that I've done kind of in my spare time uh, when I'm not working on the building and not working on the scenery of the time saver. I've, I've built a building, a structure, and the technique is, it's certainly nothing that I've pioneered by any means. This is uh, something that Bill Schopf and uh, Stephen Bennett discussed in one of his videos. And I believe that this is a technique that was kind of pioneered way back when, when there weren't a lot of structures, you know, kit structures. Uh, you know, when you couldn't buy a Banta Model Works or a Bars Mills Model or American Model Builders or, or any of the others, you know, there just wasn't a lot of options. So people just kind of did what they could to create their structures. And that's what I'm going to do here. So, uh, let's get started. So, to start with, what I did is I took two two befores and I glued them together. Uh, let it dry overnight, pressed them together so that I had really good, uh, real good glue joint throughout the entire two pieces of wood. And the next thing I did is I, is I squared it up on my table saw. So, you know, if you don't have a table saw or maybe a radial arm saw of some kind or a chop saw, then this, you know, might not be anything that you're interested in because you do need some power tools. But all I did was square up this two before so that I could begin kind of chopping away what I didn't need to create a block structure building. So the next process after you get your your block squared up uh, what I did was I just decided that a 35 degree angle is what I wanted my the pitch of my roof to be and this doesn't really show exactly the process but I cut off just very small pieces of the two before and then move the fence a little bit closer to the blade every time uh, so you'll, you'll whittle off a little bit on one side, then you flip it end for end, and then you whittle off a little bit on the other side. And I was probably cutting off, you know, maybe a quarter to a half inch each time. Uh, I just wanted to move slow so that, because if you use a whole bunch and you cut a whole bunch of it off, you might not end up with a building as tall as you would like it to be. So I just worked incrementally. Here you can see where I've taken a couple of cuts and I haven't quite made it to the center peak of the building yet. Uh, you know it's just a matter of, of working real slow and making sure that my, uh, my table saw wasn't cutting off too much wood at one time and so I could keep the as much of the height of the building as possible. Here you can see that I've gotten the pitch of the roof the way I want it. And I believe at this point the building was still just a little bit too tall and it was a lot too long. So from here I just went to my chop saw and you know I knew what the overall dimensions of the building were going to be before I started. And what this building basically is, it's the, the whistle stop junctions station without the office. Uh, I just took those dimensions and ran with them and came up with a block structure that I could adhere uh, clapboard siding to. Cut out windows. So here's the building on the layout. Uh, with its final dimensions and I went ahead and drew in where the doors and the windows were going to be. Uh, I just kind of wanted to have a good a good look at it before I actually 
began putting any of the siding on. So the next thing I did was just put on some scribe siding that I purchased from Northeast Scale Lumber and then trace the overall dimensions of either the side of the building or the front of the building. Uh, I want to say that one piece of this uh, clapboard siding, and I want to say it was two foot by six inches wide, I don't remember exactly, but it was about six dollars, so it, it's really inexpensive uh, thing to do. So here's a picture of, of tracing the the end wall and the first time I did this I got it wrong because you can see I don't have the side wall on there and so you want to make sure that when you're when you're tracing this onto your clapboard siding that one your clapboard is all running the correct way and and that you're accounting for the thickness of the sidings on either side of the wall uh, luckily I didn't completely ruin very much of it, but uh, you, you definitely want to take into account the width of the side of the buildings. And here you can see uh, the pencil marks that I've put on there. Uh, it's not rocket science by any means. You just want to make sure you get everything lined up the way you want it and, and do your dead level best to keep everything square. And that's a process that you, when you're doing with the saws, uh, I checked all of my saws with a with a square before I started cutting to make sure everything was a 90 degree angle. You can see that I labeled uh, this particular wall C. Uh, I labeled all of the walls just to make sure I knew which one I was working with at any given point in time. Having a set of calipers uh, is a really good idea for measuring the windows. Uh, you could probably do this with a with a really fine ruler with millimeter marks or something like that but I I found the calipers just to make it a lot easier because you can lock it down and and then just mark on the inside of where your calipers are and then cut leaving just a little bit of the pencil mark left over and then if the window doesn't go in just right then you just file a little bit and you'll get it to fit in just perfect once you've made a decision of where all your your windows and doors are going to be uh, I just you know if they're going to be a scale three feet up from the bottom of the floor I just you know run that line across you know the entire building I didn't take a picture of all of it but if you lay all of your pieces out in a line from left to right uh, you can run the, the top of your windows and the bottom of your windows all at once so that they all uh, there's no chance of you having a window that's a scale six inches higher than another or something crazy like that so that's just this is just a picture of showing uh, that process and then you can see the other lines that are running uh, perpendicular to the the long lines there and that's where the windows went and I did all that pretty much with the uh, with the calipers so here's the the first wall that I attempted to cut a, a door frame in uh, and, and I made the mistake of cutting on the clapboard side and I pulled the knife towards the bottom of the door and you can see that huge splinter there that's actually the bottom scale six or eight inches of the building so I had to scrap that and uh, and start over and from that point on I did all of my cutting on the back side uh, I just found it was a lot easier that way and I made sure that as I pulled my knife I was very careful about going past the end of the actual material so that you didn't you know pull the material away from itself because that's exactly what I did here and here are the two front windows and the front door uh, test footed in just checking to make sure everything fit nice and snug and no ugly gaps or anything like that uh, it worked out pretty good now as far as you know what lies beyond the windows uh, that is definitely one 
one disadvantage of doing it this way is there's there's no empty space beyond you know the block so what you have to do is is come in and, and paint the area behind the windows black and all I did was use a sharpie uh, it seemed to work pretty good and it just makes a, a negative space behind the behind the windows and here you can see the the windows and doors put in front of the black sharpie marker uh, you know I think maybe the next time I try this I might use something besides black maybe something that's not quite as pure black maybe with a little bit of gray mixed in we have to experiment with that but overall it's it's a it's a nice effect once you've got all your your door and window ways cut uh, the next step is to go ahead and glue it to the block uh, that is definitely one one advantage of doing it this way is that once you get it on there if you get it on there right you'll never have to worry about it warping all I did was use uh, some clamps and it, it glued up really easily after you get everything glued up, uh, more than likely you're going to have a little overhang on your side walls that are, that are sticking up at the angle that is not true with the angle of the roof. And all I did was take a, a sanding sponge that you can get you know, at any hardware store and very lightly started sanding until I had... Uh, that particular piece of, of wood at the exact same angle as the roof. So here's a, a view of the building uh, with everything glued up, all of the all of the clapboard siding glued on. The windows at this point are just pressed in uh, to just to kind of see how it looks. But uh, I was pretty happy at this point. I, I felt like it was going to turn out to be a pretty good building. All right, before I get into the painting and weathering process, uh, I thought I'd just kind of explain how I got into model railroading. Uh, I started out as a tabletop wargamer, and, you know, I was looking for techniques to build terrain to make use of in my tabletop battles. And my father, who had been a a model railroader early on in my childhood but you know he never he never did much beyond just pull some stuff out and run it on the floor you know way back in the in the early 70s but he said you need to look into model railroading because those guys you know make stuff that looks real and i didn't think much about it you know uh you know what does trains have to do with with tabletop battles and we happened to be working with each other at that time at a disposal well, an oil field disposal well. And I think the next day or the third day after that, he brought me a model railroad magazine. And, and I was blown away by how realistic everything looked. And, you know, from that point on, it was like, hmm, maybe I've got the wrong hobby because I dearly enjoyed the painting and the artistic value of what I was doing with the the tabletop miniatures as a matter of fact I probably spent hundreds of more hours painting than I ever did actually playing so I thought I would just go ahead and show a little bit of of my background and, and what I've done so you can kind of see where I come from uh, on the artistic side of things so when when painting hundreds of miniatures one of the first things that you're gonna do is is figure out a way to uh, make all of your processes repeatable and and finding a way to do things quickly and I kinda learned early on in the process that I wanted to limit the number of colors that I use somewhere between three and five and then just kinda create an assembly line of doing things that involved washes and dry brushing. So that's just something that I'm, I'm bringing to the model railroading aspect of, of what I do 
is is the painting process. Now, just like with model railroading, uh, there's going to be some things that you paint that are a little more upfront, uh, more of a showpiece, or something along those lines. It's going to require more than just your your three basic colors or your five basic colors uh, which involves mixing you know two or three different paints together to get a, a color that you really like uh, so you know I've I've done plenty of that as well so at any rate uh, I just thought I would I would share some of my work from a different hobby uh, kind of show what I'm capable of as far as painting and highlighting and things like that and and I hope that as I progress with my model railroading that I'm able to to do some things that are that are really nice now prior to to painting the building I went ahead and and did some driving around in town and tried to look for a building that that might be somewhat similar to what I was going to try to achieve. I'm, I'm a fan of of dark, dirty, uh, grungy looking things. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the older and, and uglier a building is, the, the more character it has. Uh, and even in all of my my painting of my miniatures, uh, I tended to do things on the darker side rather than the brighter side. Uh, a lot of people base coat in white or gray, uh, I tend to base coat in black first. But th this building I thought was a, a pretty good representation of some, some paint chipping and so I went ahead and took a picture of it just so I'd have a little bit of a reference. Uh, I don't think mine turned out quite like this but it did give me an idea of, of how I wanted to proceed. Now before I, I started painting, I went ahead and, and distressed the wood a little bit. Uh, you, can, you can see there in the, in the bottom center, uh, there's a, a steel brush. And you know again, this, this technique that I'm, I'm doing here is, is nothing new, certainly not my own idea. Uh, you can find lots of videos on how to do this. But uh, I, all I did was I took that wire brush uh, and I scuffed up the wood running with the wood grain and I concentrated a little heavier at the bottom of the building where I thought it would be a little more wear and then you can see here where I'm I'm just lifting a little bit of the clapboard I did that in various places around the building uh, just to add a little little character and a little grunge now there are many 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 different ways that you can paint and weather a building uh, and this particular technique I and really I, I can't say that I've tried any of them before because I really haven't uh, but some of them kind of are kind of like what I've done with my miniatures before but this, this particular one there's really not a, a parallel when you're you know to painting uh, miniatures so I thought I would give it a shot and it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but but all I've done is taken, uh, I believe this was antique white paint, uh, folk art antique white, just, just cheap craft paint from Walmart. And I started at the top there, and I made the top uh, pretty, pretty heavy, and then just kind of painted down and made sure that I left a lot of bare wood in randomized places. Uh, especially you know kind of around the edges of the window and stuff like that and I I think if I had to do this over again I would have paid a little closer attention to how the clapboards meet and I think I would have tried a little harder to have the paint in the crevice of the clapboard and not so much on the edge uh, because now that I, I've looked at the pictures of the finished product, I can see that it really is kind of weathered in an opposite fashion of maybe the way it would have weathered in real life. It, it's still a pretty good effect, but I, I think I will pay closer attention to that on the next structure I build. So the next process is to wash the building in, in some kind of wash that's going to stain the wood. Uh, there's lots of different 
colors that you can use. Uh, what I went with was Vallejo's dark gray wash. And I just washed the entire building, uh, all, of the, all of the white paint and the wood. And you can see that uh, what was just wood and not paint turned a nice dark gray color as if uh, all the paint had chipped off and, and was just exposed to the elements. This is a, a closer view of, of kind of the way it turned out. You can see that uh, it almost looks like that bottom board is completely rotted away to nothing. Uh, and you know you can you can apply more wash to areas. Uh, you know I, I think I there's probably two to three different uh, washings on that lower board there, and then that up at the very top there is probably just one washing. So you can vary the the different strengths of of how it comes out after after I got it washed uh, I went ahead and went back with the same color the the antique white and did just a a, a real light dry brushing of the the clapboard just to kind of help bring out a lot of the highlights uh, just to kind of to brighten up the edges of the clapboards just a little bit. Uh, I didn't do very much at all, just, just enough to kind of help define the ends of the clapboards. Now, as far as painting the windows go, uh, I'm sure this is a trick that most everyone's aware of, is to turn some painter's tape upside down and, and stick your whatever it is you know your smaller items to it so that it doesn't run away from you whenever you paint i prefer to remove uh, everything from the sprue i know a lot of people will paint on the sprue and then remove it uh, i i like to to go ahead and get rid of all of the the flashing and and any imperfections in the plastic before i paint so i don't have to mess with it later on and i went with an avocado green uh, I, you know, probably if I had it to do over, I probably would have mixed my own green. Uh, but I had happened to have a, a spray can of, of avocado green laying around. So I thought, well, I'll just use this. You know, after I had everything kind of finished on the building itself, I kind of moved to the roof and the roof is just, I, I think it's 16th inch, uh, plywood and cut to length nothing nothing special about that i did take and sand the you know the top of the roof where the where the two peaks meet i did take and and sand that back so that they would uh, come together and, and create a, a point that fit together a little bit better than just leaving it uh, a flat cut now, as far as the roofing material goes, uh, I, I did not purchase any roofing material specifically for this building. And I really thought that I had black construction paper laying around. I didn't have any black construction paper at all. Uh, I did have blue construction paper. So I spray painted my blue construction paper and then sanded away bits and pieces of it uh, and then distressed, you know, the, the edge of the, what would be tar paper, uh, the exposed edge that gets overlapped on the previous layer of tar paper. And it turned out okay. The Northeast scale lumber windows come with, uh, with acetate. And for some for some reason, they come with two panes per window. Uh, I guess maybe so you could model one of them up in the air or something like that. Uh, and what I did was was just put them in the recess and put a drop of super glue there in the middle and uh, hope that they would hold. Uh, if I were to do this again, I would probably use some other uh, clear plastic 
maybe even cut out of a toy wrapper or something that you bought from Walmart. Uh, you know, just whatever you have laying around that would work and cut it to the right length and width of, of the actual recess and then press the window in on top of that because one of my windows or maybe two of them ended up falling down after I got the window frame glued in so I wasn't very happy about that but uh, you know it's all a learning process for me so the last step of course is to weather things uh, and again you know there's there's so many different techniques to, to weathering uh, I have Bragdon powders, I believe is who they're made by. Uh, just a variety of different different powders. For the roof, I went with a really dark gray color that kind of helped hide the, the blue color that was the construction paper. And just, you know, added a little bit of browns and some red rust colors there, just to kind of mute the overall uh, color of the roof. And then I used a, a variety of, of browns and dark grays uh, at the bottom of the structure uh, just to, to make it look like rain had hit the ground and, and splattered up on the bottom. Uh, and then wherever the clapboards were kind of pulled up, I used a toothpick and the dark gray and just kind of made a, made a line running down like, you know, something's run down. That's just, uh, I guess, what most people do, so I thought I'd do it too, and I think it looks pretty good. I washed the windows, uh, I believe, in the same color that uh, I washed the wood with. Uh, I did not do any dry brushing on the windows, uh, primarily because I used a spray paint, and I didn't feel like going to the trouble of trying to match the color of the spray paint and then find a shade lighter. Uh, I suppose I could have used the antique white or some other color to, to get a little bit of highlights on the windows, but overall uh, I think it, it worked out pretty good without doing any dry brushing on the windows. Now the trim, uh, it's a scale one by six, I believe, is what I use for the trim. Uh, and all in all, it, it worked out pretty good. I think there's one corner that, that wasn't quite as square as I'd liked it to be. And, and if you look close enough in some of these pictures, I'm sure you'll, you'll see that it's gapped a little bit. And I might go back in and see if I can't uh, address that and, and make it a little bit better than it is. But I thought for my, my first attempt on, on creating a, a block wooden structure, uh, it, it turned out pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly satisfied with it. Definitely learned some things. Now, Bill Shop mentions that this is quicker than, uh, than building a regular kit structure. And, and it may be, uh, I, I probably haven't built enough of the uh, kit structures to know exactly how long it should take to build one of those. I think I've only built one, one other wooden structure prior to this one, and it was an in-scale model. And to be honest, I didn't complete it. <laughs> Very similar to my Lale and Son structure there that is still not completed. Uh, but that one will get completed, I promise. It's next on my list of things to do, I believe, as far as structures go. But I think I will, I think I'll build one more block structure for sure. Uh, and I think I'm going to try and come up with some kind of uh, little work shed, uh, you know, some other kind of smaller structure to go with Lale and Sons and have it be in their yard maybe for you know some kind of storage building or something like that just a, a much smaller building than the one i just did but uh, the the key point about this whole thing with me was was how cheap it was i've probably got less than 12 total dollars in this build uh, I, I used less than half of the 
clapboard siding that I purchased. Uh, and I don't, I mean, I think one package of windows is about three bucks. Uh, and one package of doors is about three bucks. So I, I may have had nine or twelve dollars in in the the doors and windows, uh, and the roof. I can't remember how much the roof was, but you know, uh, but I've still got plenty of material to build another one or two or three buildings. Uh, I've got all the two befores in the world. I can do this again with. So whether or not you would want it up front, because there's no depth in the building. Uh, not having any any scenery on the inside uh, that's probably the biggest reason not to do it uh, but if, if you've got buildings in your background that aren't really going to catch everybody's eye uh, this is definitely I, I think a keeper as far as a, as a technique to do I will be doing more of these for sure and uh, I also plan on on trying an actual scratch build with an interior at some point too. I just don't know what that structure will be yet. But uh, I dearly enjoyed uh, doing this and I'm looking forward to doing more.